Community Television. You're watching West Hartford Community Television. You're watching West Hartford Community Television. You're watching West Hartford Community Television. For the community, by the community. Hi, it's Jeff Grandy again. Welcome. Thanks for dropping in. Uh, former Haw High Warrior, Georgia Bulldog, Hartford Hawk, Yukon Husky. Um, and it's uh, going to be a very interesting show today. As you know, it's Journeys. Uh, we all have a story. Everybody's had a, everybody's life is a journey, a story, and we have a very interesting guest today to share his story and journey with us. And uh, I'd like to welcome Boyce Beatty. Thank Boyce. you for having invited me, Jeff. Well, thank you for coming. It's nice to see you. Tell us. Let's start. Uh, let's start the, ver the, the the voyage. Let's start the journey. Where were you uh, born? Where are you from, Boyce? Eighty-three years ago, I was born in New London, Connecticut. My mother was a registered nurse. My father was a lawyer and a commander in the Coast Guard. And he traveled throughout the country to bases where Coast Guard places were located. San Francisco, Atlantic City, uh, Cleveland, uh, uh, and so forth. So as a child, I had experiences as all of those places. In New London, I saw a calf being born out in the woods and then alarmed the far farmer about that. In uh, San Francisco at three years old, I was walking down the street following a man with squeaky shoes. In uh, Cleveland, I uh, attended the uh, John Marshall High School where I played the trumpet in the band and uh, was on the track team running decathlon and the uh, long distances. So and when your when your father moved from place to place, you moved with him. Right, of course, yes. Okay, and and was that difficult in terms of new schools, getting to know new friends, no, or did you no, kind of? No, it wasn't difficult at all. My my brother was born my younger brother born when we were in San Francisco and but 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 throughout that early childhood I don't remember very much other than uh, going back and forth and and what my parents have told me about it and and also in uh, Cleveland at John Marshall High School I was on uh, the uh, team that was uh, uh, and running the decathlon and and, uh, and did very well at that graduated from John Marshall, received a uh, scholarship to Princeton University, attended that for four years, uh, earning a uh, Bachelor of Arts degree in uh, uh, English literature and uh, psychology, and wrote my senior thesis on children, the psychopathological environment and moral consciousness in the literary achievement of Henry James. And if you've ever read any of Henry James, some of his sentences go on for several pages with modifying and qualifying phrases and clauses and then has been compared to a golf ball dropping and then continuing to bounce and bounce and bounce and bounce. What would you say is the, in your research with the child children's psychology, whether, what would you say was uh, one or two of the most interesting or salient well, things that you, that well, you learned it, or discovered? It, it was the, ma mainly the works of Henry James that I was writing on, and primarily the novella, The Turn of the Screw, which is one of the more elegant ghost stories in history. Yeah. And that was the beginning of my interest in the paranormal. So when I graduated from Princeton, I went down to Duke University 
to study in the laboratory of Dr. Joseph Banks Rhine, kind of the godfather of parapsychology in the United States, and worked uh, at nighttime while I was studying in, in the laboratory at the Durham Herald Sun as a proofreader, but got a, got a very large background in parapsychology there and from there moved on to uh, Cleveland uh, and uh, in Cleveland uh, was uh, helpful in founding the Communications Research Association, a group of parapsychologists and physicists and doctors studying the laws and phenomena of the paranormal. Well, Ryan, Ryan not only was a theorist, but he actually he did uh, experiments and, and, and clinical studies, didn't yes, he? Yes, he, he encouraged me to use the kind of studies that he was using with the five different cards of different shapes and studying um, telepathy, clairvoyance, clairsentience, clairaudience, claircognizance, and, and uh, retrocognition, and uh, the psychopara psychological anomaly of recurrent spontaneous psychokinesis, which is poltergeistry. He encouraged me to do the book work, but I was more interested in the work that his wife, Louisa Ryan, was doing with studies of, of uh, reports throughout the world of, of near-death experiences, of out-of-the-body experiences, and phenomena that Dr. Ryan was not studying at all. And, and Dr. Ryan encouraged me to do the kind of studying that he was doing with dice rolling down the s slides and counting the number of uh, times the, that your mind was thinking that it would go to one side or the other. But that, did, that, did, th did those experiences convince you that there's more than just, there's more to this it certainly material did. world that meets the eye than meets the it, eye? It certainly did. And uh, then after that, that, I went on to Cleveland where I founded that organization and, and uh, there uh, became a, a member of the Spiritual Frontiers Fellowship, became a second vice president of it, an organization that is interested in studying the uh, interface between parapsychology and religion. And then from Chicago, I uh, and I joined uh, Etna Life and Casualty, and then I moved from Chicago. Was promoted to the home office in Hartford of Etna. Well, what was your job as a employee of Etna? Uh, well, I was supervising five different offices throughout the country, especially in the lawsuits that they were raising, and at that same time, I became the executive director of the Academy for Spiritual and Consciousness Studies Incorporated, a group of academicians and scholars interested in the interface between parapsychology and religion, considering that parapsychology provides the authority model of empirical science having a bearing on all the claims of religion, especially the efficacy of prayer spiritual healing, and survival of some extrasomatic component of consciousness following the death of the physical body. And for 26 years, I put together annual conferences of this academy, inviting other parapsychologists, physicists, medical doctors, and others to, um, to give their speeches and then put together the proceedings of each conference and give, gave that to all our members as part of their membership dues. And, but also, in addition to that, I was conducting research primarily on haunted houses and the parapsychopathological anomaly of recurrent spontaneous psychokinesis. And in doing those, I was using academic and scientific uh, ways of going about doing this, eliminating any possibilities of fraud or, or the lack of statistics or anything of that type or kind. 
And the most important one of those investigations was of a poltergeist case, the parapsychopathological anomaly of recurrent spontaneous psychokinesis, as academics total them, poltergeist case in Bridgeport, Connecticut, where some 2,000 people gathered around the house in which it was announced that a somehow huge objects were moving about and those people thought that Satan was in the house and they were picking leaves off of the rose bushes and chipping the concrete swans on the front porch to get souvenirs of this. Some three people were arrested for trying to burn the house down. But these people were attracted by publicity on radio and television of this event where huge objects were moving around the house and and people could not explain or understand it, and uh, and well, so. Boys, did you have along this line? Did you have any direct experiences yourself that convinced you that there was some oh, oh, efficacy yeah. to oh, this? Oh yes, I was in the house when when this when just after this was went on because I called in a team from Durham, North Carolina who were specialists in poltergeistry and investigation of it in order to help, but I was the prime uh, leader. And, and what I did was make a layout diagram of the house to scale one inch to one foot and uh, I made hundreds of copies of that and then interviewed some 32 people who were eyewitnesses to evidence of the details of what was happening in the house and uh, on the uh, made tape recordings of those and on these sheets of paper indicated what a person was talking, what the date was, what the time, what had happened immediately before psychologically in the house, what object moved, what trajectory it took, uh, all kind of details. And then eventually wrote details about that. And, and then uh, several years ago, William Hall, who was a, a boy of 10 years old at the time living in Bridgeport and who had been there and seen things happening, uh, uh, contacted me because this uh, episode of Poltergeist was publicized all over the world in newspapers, in magazines, and this was ongoing. Police were called into the house to investigate. Fire department officials called in, and they were frightened by some of the things they saw, like like uh, refrigerators lifting up off the uh, floor, and and uh, by people uh, being flung against the wall, and and so forth. Uh, but 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 it, it totally surprised him. So I collected all of this data, and when William Hall called me, having looked at newspapers describing this and my name in them, asked me if I had anything to share about that. I invited him over to the house, gave him the original uh, tape recordings, and also all of these. Layout diagrams to scale of what was occurring into the house. He made copies, did some more research of his own, and then he wrote this book, which is a scientific explanation of the details that happened in the house. And he used Can we get a, a close up of that. Yes, he he used a rather Hold that up for the camera. We he could. used a rather hyperbolic title, "The World's Most Haunted House." To, to can, sell it. Uh, hold that just yes. so people can see the cover. Yeah. Um, the World's, the most, world's haunted most Haunted House, and that's the William one in Bridgeport. Hall, and, <coughs> and, and you get it on. Uh, did the did the did the debunkers, and I'm sure there were people no, who oh, trying oh, yeah. to. Oh, yes. Uh, did, they, did they have any. What? Well, what? It, it started with the police. Things were happening, huge television sets flipping over. And one time, a policeman who was there saw the little girl who was the, the poltergeist agent uh, use her foot for a television lying on his face 
and twist it, and, and it spun around. He told his lieutenant, and they publicized on the radio and television that this is all a fraud. The girl is, it's a hoax by the little girl. And they did that in order to get rid of all of these 2,000 people gathered around the house with traffic back up to the throughway and, and so forth, and they dismiss it. And even in uh, newspapers uh, abroad, uh, there is an indication that that uh, that this was a hoax or deemed to be a hoax, but a number of newspapers and magazines and and uh, research done on it indicate that it was uh, factual. And this book documents it in fact. Well, that's that's quite a contrast. Uh, you uh, you got a uh, on the one hand your uh, mainstream establishment corporate executive, right, and on the other hand you're you're kind of a off the off the. Uh, the road kind of a metaphysician and uh, parapsychology. Yeah. Interesting well, that, that, that's been, contrast. And that was very much the focus <clears throat> of the activity in this Academy for Spiritual and Consciousness Studies Incorporated. You can get it on uh, by Googling it, uh, www.ascsi.org and get details of what, uh, what, what, what the entire organization was about. Well, I'm sure some of our viewers were... When I became 80 years old, my, uh, I, uh, an, an octogenarian, I asked my board of directors to find another executive director, but they took two years to do it, and finally I found another executive director to replace me in it, but for... Oh, over 36 years, I was engrossed in this whole area, not only doing research, but uh, but also of studying it in great depth. And what was uh, what was family life like? You, you were uh, do you have children? Oh yes, uh, I and had two uh, two sons and a wife, and we lived in in um, Bloomfield, where I still now live, and. Uh, family life just continued on and are your sons into some of the same no my sons spirituality uh, no my sons are very very religious almost um, uh, um, Christ so, so Christian that there is no other religion and they deem much of this as being anathema of Satan and so forth of, of parapsychology even the scientific area which is my interest in it. Well, like you said before, though, Boyce, um, in the, there, there's, there's a growing interface between mainstream religion and uh, the, the moral and ethical teachings and so on and, and, uh, and uh, parapsychology. There is indeed. You're, you're quite an ecumenicalist. You see a lot of overlap well, a person, a person who who is knowledgeable about the replicated again and again and again data of uh, the paranormal, telepathy, clairvoyance, clairsentience, clairaudience, retrocognition, precognition, near-death experiences, out-of-the-body experiences, and becomes knowledgeable about that, when they look at the Bible, they see how very large amounts of the Bible, which are deemed to be fiction or so forth, are ways in which the ancient people understood these phenomena that still continue in our culture. Along with all of this, I became a certified transpersonal hypnotherapist using hypnotherapy to re put people into deep plenary states and allow them to experience, quote, memories of a previous lifetime. And although there was a great deal of ab reactions, very, very strong emotional data contained in these memories, and some people believe these to have been accurate memories of a past life, but I don't believe that. I, my thrust was more that of a past life therapist believing that under hypnosis 
the subconscious mind comes up with details of a story that relates to the difficulty, whether spiritual, mental, emotional, relationships, physical difficulties, a person is experiencing, and they put it all in a past life framework, and yet it's a very veridical way of explaining what is happening to a person in this lifetime, and having brought this out to them, with a belief that it's a past life carryover, they are healed of these various difficulties. After a lifetime of all the exploration and the research and the experiences you had, what can, what can you tell us is your, what, what is the most important belief that, you can, that you've taken from all of these experiences in, the, in your life? Well, the, the, that there are several. The near-death experience is, is one. In the near-death experience where people will write, there's a woman at the Hartford Hospital a few years back. During an operation, she rose, or her spirit, her flesh, her double, her spirit rose out of her body, could see what the doctors and nurses in the operating theater were doing, and what they were saying rose through a roof in the operating theater, through several levels of the hospital, up onto the hospital roof, from which she could see a panoramic view of Hartford and a red woman's shoe in a gutter on the hospital roof. And when, when she was resuscitated following her surgery, she mentioned this to the doctors and nurses who, as most scientists, used the reductionistic explanations grounded oh. in philosophical materialism that it was. Okay. And, but a nurse who heard this told an intern who took a janitor to the hospital roof, they found the red woman's shoe in the gutter, brought it down, showed it to the doctors, and they couldn't make it. But thousands of these kind of cases happen. And sometimes the spirit or the consciousness will travel hundreds or thousands of miles distant, see or hear something in detail, return, describe it to researchers who will go out and duplicate, replicate exactly what and corroborate exactly what happened at that time that the person was uh, in the near-death state. Boyce, we've got a, only a few minutes left. Okay. Uh, very briefly, you, you, I, I know you say you've, uh, uh, last two things I want to touch on, you've done a lot of traveling around the world. Yes, I have. And if you could tell us about a couple of those, and then I want to talk about your most recent uh, work as, as a, 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 a docent Right. at oh, the oh, Noah Webster House. Yeah. I want to talk about that for a minute. But right. very briefly, can you tell us what these objects are and where they're from? I've traveled to Tibet, to uh, the Galapagos Archipelago, to Antarctica. And in Tibet got this... In 1950, when the whole religion of Tibet was de decimated by the Chinese Revolution. There were over 6,000 uh, Tibetan Buddhist monasteries in Tibet. When I was there in 1998, there were only three left. We traveled all over Tibet. One night, we left our tents in the fields where yaks were grazing, went up to the Tibetan monastery above and saw a releasing of the spirits from the deceased Tibetans by blowing on the oh. conches. And what is, what is this, boys? In Australia, I got this most ancient of all wind instruments. It's a didgeridoo. The aborigines use this in order to raise their consciousness into the divine afterlife. And this is done with circular breathing where you learn how to breathe at the same time you're blowing out. Wow. Okay, very good. I wish we could, we had time constraints, 
very briefly, uh, could you just uh, bring us through the those items that, that you showed me when we were at the Noah Webster house? Yes. Uh, you have it on a piece of paper yes, there, I, do you? I, I've been a docent as a, a hospice volunteer where I learned more about life than death. But Did you want to just step, spend a few seconds going through yes. each one? Yes. At, at Noah Webster's house, where I've been a docent or a historical interpreter for uh, some uh, uh, some 29 years now, but the most important thing about Noah Webster was that he wrote the little blue back speller that you're seeing now. And that blueback speller was created in order that all Americans would spell words the same and pronounce words the same in order to create a single American language rather than a British language and culminated in his writing the 1828 American Dictionary of the English Language. And he was only 25 years old when he wrote the Blueback Speller and 67 years old when he wrote the other. And he not only wrote a, that, but a, a, but a form of the Constitution that was the basis for writing the Constitution. Another object was Jacob's Ladder, which with child's toy, which when you hold it, uh, sections go down and then you turn it around, sections go down. I ask people if they know what it is, few know, and I tell them it's a Jacob's Ladder, ask why, and they don't know, and I tell them in the Bible, Jacob has a dream, and in the dream, a ladder goes toward heaven, and on that ladder, angels come down from heaven, so it's Jacob's Ladder. And then you see a uh, pipe tool where uh, People don't know what it is, and I show, told him that back in the 18th century, both men and women smoked pipes, and a woman would put tobacco in the pipe, tamp, tamp it down, get a red-hot hole from the fireplace, light the pipe, smoke it, and then when the tobacco was burned up, what was pipe tobacco called, and I tell them it's called dottle, and then there is a wick trimmer I showed to them, which is trim the wicks when candles are burning and the candle keeps burning, but the lighted end goes into the box on the candle. And then there's a bed warmer and you um, warm, put red hot coals in the pan and put the uh, pan between the sheets, rub it back and forth to make the warmth of the uh, apparent to you. and. Uh, and uh, psychoneurophysiologically, the reason for that is that when the outer part of the body is warm and the inner core is cooler, then it's easier to get to sleep than when the outer core is cold and the inner core is warmer. Just so the same reason you take a bed, a shower, a hot shower before going to bed. And uh, those were a few of the items that were were there. And uh, okay, well, uh, I wish we. Uh the only frustrating thing about my fascinating guests are the time constraints. We are out of time, and I want to thank you for coming and sharing a fascinating, fascinating life story with us. And uh, I, I could, I, I think I could say you as well as other guests we could take hours more. But uh, thank you for that, and uh, thank you all for, for tuning in. And if there's anybody, any of you out there would like to share your journey, we all have a life, uh, ups and downs, trials and tribulations, joy and sadness. Love to have you come in and uh, share your uh, story with us. Tune in at the end of the, at, they give the credits. I think there'll be a, uh, a telephone number or a website you can contact. Uh, contact us and share your story with us. And uh, thank you again. See you next time. Mm -hmm.